Hello. Blah, blah.
Good evening, sir. Hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. Glad to be with y'all tonight. Excited to study Acts chapter 11 with y'all. Um, as we get started, what can we be in prayer about? And is that Nancy or Bert or or Nancy, Homer's Nancy, mom? Okay, I couldn't. Thank you. Excellent. We have a praise report for B, and we have a prayer for Bonnie May. Bonnie. Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie, for some spots on her legs that she may have to get some treatment for. Good to know. Okay. The family of Pat Harris. Gotcha. EC tennis team state tournament with some traveling. Where they travel to. Yeah. Oh, I believe we are, <laughs> but I don't think they can hear y'all as well as they can hear me, so probably be, you're probably okay. For the folks who are here and working on it, and for the folks who uh, contributed, very grateful. I thought it went really well, and we got a lot of good feedback, a lot of forms with people volunteering to do stuff who helped out with that. Good, good. It certainly did for us. It took a lot of energy. All right. Um, I've been uh, asked, I guess, to head up uh, a project uh, 
described or has a, a room in the back of the house that Bill had bought William to replace the old ones with and some of the old ones look like they're about to fall out and, and it needs some painting on the outside it needs some pretty good work on it um, and I was told around some folks up to help with it um, so I guess we, we need to see if we can round some folks up that help okay Olin has a project of doing a little um, home maintenance stuff at Dee's house and he could use some help so if you hear that if you're within the sound of my voice wherever you are and you would like to do that and, and love and support Dee just let uh, Olin know Yeah. Sound good? Okay. Uh, I've got the two of the windows. One of the windows I can get to if it's a storage room. There's two more of them. Or is there another storage room that are under lock and key? They're under combination lock. D doesn't know the combination. He has to get Parker to unlock it. Well, you, you already got one. That's great. All right. Anything else? Let's pray. Merciful God, gracious God, we give you thanks for the time that we have tonight to be together in Christian fellowship, to be together to study the scriptures and to be together to hear from the scripture about who you are and who you have been and who you will be for us as we move forward into whatever future you have for us. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are not here. Um, we especially lift up uh, Vani this, this evening and the care that she may have to receive um, for her legs. We ask that you would safeguard her heart and mind. We also ask that you would bless over Homer and Nancy and Polly and, and the whole crew um, and strengthen them for the important work that they're doing of loving and caring for each other. We give you thanks for Bee's recovery and, and we recognize in her and as we also recognize in Bonnie in so many other ways that you are a God of healing, a God who brings healing and new life and wholeness. So we give you thanks for that. At the same time, we recognize that there are many who are suffering heartache and we pray for uh, the family of Pat Harris, and for all the other ones that we carry around in our heart who we know are suffering, who we know are grieving, um, we ask that you would comfort them and be with them and stand beside them in their heartache. Be with the tennis team as they travel back and forth, keep them safe on the roads, and um, help them to play well and for a spirit of sportsmanship to prevail no matter what happens. Um, and just be with us tonight as we study scripture and bless over us as we are here and bless over those who are joining us online. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So we had Acts 10. We had a two-week break or one-week break or however long it was. Then last week, Sarah Jo came back and we did some recap on Acts 10. And so tonight we carry on with Acts 11, the tail end of Acts 11. I mean the front of Acts 11, which is the tail end of our story from Acts 10. It's a lot of the same stuff we've been talking about. We're just going to keep on going after it. So, but I want us to start tonight with a question. What makes a Christian a Christian? So what is essential to Christianity? To give you an example of what I'm talking about, could we all agree that it is not your hairstyle? Christians can have whatever kind of hairstyle they want to have. Uh, your luck? I said, you are in luck. Oh, yeah, I'm in luck. <laughs> That's for sure. That's very true. That's very true. Um, you should have seen it a little while ago. But uh, is it your taste in music? No. Christians can listen to, you know, Christians have a wide variety of tastes, depending on time, culture. I mean, the music we listen to today, the Christians of the 1300s would probably not appreciate, you know. 
They probably wouldn't have dug Hank Williams or whatever it is. So, uh, so it's not that, but what is essential to Christianity? What, what will we say? And you're in luck because I'm going to write down the answers. <laughs> been working on it a long time <laughs> so far it hasn't taken okay okay and then you said faith in Anything else you want to say? Love for? Love? Just love? That, you know, their love for fellow man. Their love for, for God. Love God first. And then... It's hard to write sideways is my problem. <laughs> but then you can't see. I don't want to... <laughs> Okay, so I had these, I'm really trying to articulate the same thing, but if you want to break them into two different questions, that's totally fine too. So far, following Jesus or faith in Jesus, love for God, love for neighbor. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Okay. I put Bible as word, but I think we know what that means. <laughs> Busted. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's the point. Anything else? If you don't have anything else, that's fine. I just don't want anybody, if you're sitting on something, you've been debating whether or not to say it. Okay. Second Timothy three fifteen. All scripture is inspired by God. Suitable for reproof, teaching, whatever. I don't know. It's in there somewhere. Teaching, reproof, and something else. All right. We can come back to it if we want to. But I want to get the things percolating here. Okay. So what makes a Christian a Christian or what is essential to Christianity? Following Jesus, faith in Jesus, love for your fellow man, love for God, Apostles' Creed, belief in the Bible as the word of God. Okay. We would, we would want to say those things are essential to Christianity. So, um, I have handouts here and because there are some quotes as I was reading through different commentaries and things this week. I came across several quotes that I thought were so good I just wanted to share them with y'all. So um, I just went ahead and printed a little thing here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think I printed 10 in. We'll just give, we'll start with one a couple. And our folks online, I, I believe Sarah Joe's going to work these quotes into our got extras now maybe I did print enough I don't know 
Okay. So, Peter, if we open our Bibles to Acts chapter 11, verse 1, Peter gets back to his folks in Jerusalem. Now the apostles and believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? So Peter gets back and he has to answer for what has gone down. So I have this quote at the beginning. Peter is called up in the strangeness. He is back in Jerusalem where he must give an account of his actions. The good news had reached Judea that the unexpected had happened. Gentiles received the word of God from a Jew. It was, however, not yet received as good news by the Jewish followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. Questions had to be answered that would determine whether Peter had betrayed sacred covenant and covenantal identity by communing with Gentiles in the intimate space of food and fellowship, eating and desiring, speaking and disclosing. Such a serious matter always haunted diaspora. Would the journey to distant lands, surrounded by Gentiles, weaken the commitment of the faithful to the story of God's promise? Would people be lost from the inside out? These questions were now angled toward Peter in his disturbing actions. So the last two times we met, we talked about how the circumcision and the food laws and all those things were about identity and survival when you're surrounded by a a culture that is radically different than yours. If you don't hang on to those marks of your own particular identity, then I love the way he says, the people, will the people be lost from the inside out? The people will still be there, but beginning with changes and all those, you know, changes in the heart and habit and all those things, people will be lost from the inside out. So that is what, when he gets back to Jerusalem, that's what folks are afraid of. So they ask him. Uh, the circumcised believers criticized him, verse 2 says, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Now, we've said it before, but let's keep keep it in front of us. Up to this point, Christianity is a Jewish movement. This is a sect within Judaism. And you could call it maybe a renewal movement. You could call it whatever you want. But it is a sect within Judaism. As Pat pointed out, later on in Acts, not too far from now, um, later in this chapter, we get Christians for the first time. But so far, it's just a sect within Judaism. Um, so the, the people who believe that Jesus was the long way to Jewish Messiah are Jewish. Um, in Acts, we have seen this belief, belief in Jesus, but now it's finally breaking out of Jerusalem and, and Judaism into the larger world. They don't know that they are part of a worldwide religion yet. They think they're just Jewish. And some of the foundational identity markers of Judaism are circumcision, and the food laws. They don't know that they are a part of this worldwide movement that's going to incorporate everybody. They think they're Jewish. They're just, they just have a disagreement of who Jesus is, but they're basically Jewish. Now they find out that Peter has baptized non-Jewish people into this religion, and he has some explaining to do. Now here we meet some new characters who are very important. Uh, the circumcised believers. The circumcised believers. And this is a quote from N.T. Wright. This is clearly a hardline group within the Jerusalem believers, a smaller pressure group within the larger but still Jewish group of believers. These are folks within the Jesus movement who feel very strongly that anyone who would enter the new Jesus movement must become Jewish, which would mean circumcision for men. So we've got to think, you have Jewish people who live in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, which is the heart of Judaism. But because of Babylonian exile, Assyrian exile, and a variety of other things, all across the world you have pockets of Persia and surrounded by Gentiles, right? Now, inevitably, just like with, just like there's how many people in here? 16 people, something like that? A wide variety of personalities and opinions and everything else. And you could find Jewish people who, if you ask them about Gentiles, they would say, You know, the Gentiles aren't that bad, honestly. I mean, my neighbor Steve, he's a nice enough guy. He takes care of his yard and, you know, whatever else. You could find Jews who would say, and then you could find Jews, people who, because of their, for whatever reason, because of how they were living in the diaspora, 
who wouldn't who would who wouldn't spit on a Gentile person that was on fire, right? They just had that much disdain for them. Now these people all come into the Jesus movement. So when Peter goes and starts building relationships with Gentiles, inevitably some of them are going to be like, huh, cool. And some of them are going to be like, I did not see that coming. And some of them are going to be like, over my dead body, are we doing that, right? There's a wide variety of reactions. And there is a group within the Jerusalem church that is especially committed to anybody that wants to join this thing has to be Jewish, has to do all the stuff of Jewish. So the circumcised believers, it's not the believers, it's not the same thing as like just the believers. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, a small faction, uh, what we might today call a caucus, a special interest group, whatever you want to call it. It's a group within that has an agenda that they feel like needs to get pushed. Now, I have this quote from Stephen Fowl, which I think is really, really helpful for us because he kind of really helps us remember uh, how important this is. So he says, from the perspective of a church made up almost exclusively of Gentiles for nearly 2,000 years, it may be hard to recognize the merits of the pro-circumcision argument. Nevertheless, it would be fairly consistent for a Jewish follower of Jesus both to recognize Gentiles as capable of receiving the gospel and simply to assume that they would, in all other respects, become Jewish. These first followers of Jesus did not see their convictions about Jesus as in any way incompatible with Judaism. That's important. They didn't see following Jesus as leaving Judaism. He's the Jewish Messiah. Um, they quite rightly recognized that God was bringing Gentiles into Israel, not that they were going out from Israel to be joined with Gentiles. Given these presumptions, it seems quite natural to expect Gentiles who join this group to be circumcised and observe the law. While there are few exceptional cases, the vast majority of Jews would have simply presumed that joining Israel implied circumcision and that they had numerous good reasons for thinking this. Further, these reasons are neither obviously nor necessarily negated by faith in Christ. So the point is, following Jesus, there's nothing that's obvious about following Jesus means you don't have to get circumcised, at least on the surface, for Jewish people. Okay. In short, the pro-circumcision people... Um, had a very strong case. And it may even be that Luke considered the arguments here so self-evident that he didn't have the characters rehearse them, which is an interesting point because there's not a lot of... Peter is obviously in trouble. He has to explain himself. The other side doesn't have to explain themselves. And perhaps Luke considered it so obvious, like everybody knows obviously, you know. Um, so we asked earlier what would make someone a Christian or what is essential to being a Christian or a Christian being a Christian. So for a Jew, the answer would surely include circumcision and following the dietary laws of the Old Testament. These circumcised believers feel very strongly that circumcision and the dietary laws of the Old Testament continue to be essential to Judaism. So they demand an explanation. Now, the circumcised believers, if we depend on how much time we have, and certainly if not tonight, then the next time, we'll look at how this pops up throughout the rest of the New Testament. This is just the very beginning of an argument that's going to continue for the rest of the New Testament. Um, but Peter gets back, and they want some explanation from Peter. Now, I've got a really just a beautiful quote here, um, I think, from Willie Jennings. I hate to be just be reading this much this, tonight, but we're going to get in a second to, to more interesting stuff, I guess. Although nothing's really more interesting than this. This is just great. I love the way he puts this. Um, he talks about the vulnerability of Peter in this moment. Okay? Peter is one of the three main disciples who's like part of Jesus' inner circle, and he's an obvious leader in the new church. Peter has been healing people. He has been casting out demons. I mean, he's been, Peter is obviously well-respected in this church, and yet, in this moment, God has put him way out on a limb. Not just out on a limb, on a limb, on a limb, on a limb. And so Jennings, this quote from Jennings is trying to explain that to us. Peter's sisters and brothers in the new faith are quite serious about that faith's sure foundation in Israel. And now this traveling apostle must give a justification for his actions. This is an impossible assignment for Peter because he must explain the inexplicable. He must suture together a known faithfulness with an unknown faithfulness and bring together obedience to ancient word and spirit 
with obedience to spirit and present word. And Peter has only one option. He must give voice to his experience. Peter stands before his redeemed kin in utter vulnerability. He has no textual witness to fall back on, no prophetic utterance to conjure from collective memory of his people. The prophets of old did not prepare him for this Gentile emergency. He is speaking to those who know him and know the faith. The only argument Peter could give with kinship eyes bearing down on him was no argument at all, simply an experience. Peter will explain himself, but it will not simply be an explanation of himself, but also of God pressing in on him. And his experience reveals God. So, what Peter is about to do as he gets questioned is share his experience of what happened. And that's all he has. Peter can't say, well, let's look at Philippians 2 or Galatians 5 or Acts 10. He can't appeal to any scriptural Thing. Peter can't point to previous examples like uh, we would say, you know, uh, precedents in a you know case law from from prior examples or anything. He's got nothing. Everybody wants an explanation, and all he has is his experience of what God has done. And that for Peter is a very serious moment of vulnerability to stand before everyone, and everybody's mad, and everybody wants to know why you did this thing. And all you can do is say, uh, let me try to tell you what happened, you know? And that's where Peter is. So when we look at verse uh, 1 through 3 again, now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step. Okay? Now, that's all he can do is just explain it to them. And I put here, um, you have a little thing that has a side-by-side -side comparison here. And for our folks online, we, I don't have one for you, but you have Acts 10 and 11. You can just turn the page. Um, but basically, what's interesting is in Acts 11, Acts 11 recounts with a lot of detail a lot of Acts chapter 10. Now, the Bible uses extreme economy of language. If the Bible repeats something, it must be important. The Bible doesn't waste words. Often we read the Bible and we say, I wish I had more information. The Bible very rarely wastes words. So if, if it's repeating something, it must be important. If we look at this, there is no reason that it has to be like this. So, for example, they say they're criticizing him and they want to know what happened. It could very easily go from verse 4 and skip straight to verse 18. It could say, Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step. When they heard, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Surely God has given you know, the repentance that leads to new life. So there's no reason to go back through all of this drama. He could just say, Peter explained it to them, and they rejoiced but it repeats all of this. And so let's look at it kind of side by side so we can see. So in Acts chapter 10, we're told he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. If we look over to Acts chapter 11, Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners. And it came close to me. And as I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill, and eat. Not exact word for word, but very close, right? And again, there's no reason that he has to necessarily repeat this. But Peter, if we skip over to 10, to the left side, Peter says, By no means, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. Peter, recounting his experience, says, But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. So Peter, again, he's just going by, step by step, laying it all out for him. All he can do is tell them what happened. And Acts repeats chapter 10. Now the question I have is, why do you think Luke spent so much time repeating Acts chapter 10? Because that's all he had. It's 
It definitely made an impression on Peter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so a lot. So it obviously had a big impact on Peter, and then Annette also adds a lot of times when other people hear your personal experience, it has more meaning to them because it's your personal experience. Mm-hmm. Okay, so obviously um, Luke repeats this in part just to emphasize it, just like we heard, like. This is a critical moment in the book of Acts and in the New Testament. And so Luke slows us down and and repeats it, right? Another thing that I think is going on here is, do you remember whenever I did Acts chapter 10 several weeks ago now, I sent you home with Acts 10 through 15 and asked you to circle and think about all the places where God did something. So it's just to kind of get a sense of the activity of God and the action of God. I think Luke repeats this to help reiterate that this is something that God did and not something that Peter did. So if we look at Acts chapter 11, we can just do this again pretty quickly by ourselves here. If we look at Acts chapter 11, uh, let's look at that first little chunk, 5 to 7. Where, where is God doing something here? In verses 5 through 7. It's the vision, right? Peter fell into a trance and saw a vision. Now, if we're in a trance, are we particularly active? No. He fell into a trance like a mummy and has his vision. So God is doing this, right? He replies in the next 8 through 10, um, I replied, by no means, Lord. But a second time the voice answered. So God is not only is he seeing things, but he's hearing from God, right? At that very moment, folks arrive from Caesarea. And then what happens in verse 12? The Spirit told me to do it. (laughs) The Spirit told me to do it, okay? It's not my fault. The Spirit told me to do it. And then, what's in the next one? These six brothers accompanied me. So remember how I said last time he took took a group with him in case something went bad going to see these Gentiles because you can't trust these Gentiles? Well, it turns pretty lucky because now he he can say like, if you don't believe me, these six people were here with me. So it's not just his personal experience, but it's their personal experience as well. Um, We entered the man's house. Verse 13 repeats that guy's experience of God, right? That guy had an angel come and talk to him. Then verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And I remembered the word of the Lord. So I think part of what Luke is doing is helping us to see just what, what Luke is reiterating is the activity of God who is the driver of all of this. I think that's a big part of it. But what I think is also really interesting about it is kind of like what Annette said. If we step back from the content of the speech, if we just like step back from it for a moment and look at it in a a bigger picture, what we are watching and witnessing here is the power of personal testimony to change people. Because independent of, if we, if it just said, uh, Peter explained it to them step by step. And when they heard his explanation, they rejoiced. It's the same result as what we get to. But what we miss is Peter bearing witness to his own experience. What we miss is Peter's actual testimony of what happened. And I think what Luke, I think one of the things that we get to see here is the power that personal testimony and witness has to change people, to to make a difference to convince people, right? You know, it's like Annette said, it means more to people when it comes from them. A few years ago, um, Sarah Jo uh, had a revival. Wasn't it a revival when we did it? Yeah. And, but you did it during Lent, too. Sarah Jo, several different times, tried to incorporate um, folks coming and sharing their testimony and witness and things like that, right? I'll speak to it, but you can if you want to, but. Come 
We did it at a revival, and um, after after those experiences, I started trying to do it at my church. So I started saying, like, if you want to share a word from God, like, I will put you, I will put you up here. You just come talk to me, and we'll. And I only had a few takers, but I really tried. And and the few people that did, I think it really made a difference to people because, you know, I'm the preacher. I get paid to stand up and say things about God. So it's like, well, of course he's saying that he's the preacher. Well, I mean, what do you expect the preacher to say, right? But if somebody else from the church gets up there and says, you know, here's what God said to me when I was reading the Bible the other day or whatever, it just hits people differently. And that's part of what we're seeing, what we get to witness here in Acts, is Peter is way out on a limb, and all he can do is say, here's here's what God did with me. And then he gets to the end of it, and he says, "Um, if then... God gave them the gift that he gave us. When we believe in the Lord, who was I that I could hinder God? All Peter can do is say, this is what God did, and what can I do? I mean, if that's what God said, that's what God said. If that's what God did, that's what God did, you know? So we get to see the power of of personal testimony to change people and to change situations, and I think that's just a really, really powerful thing that happens again and again in Acts, especially Um, But we get to see that here in this moment as well. When he finishes this, verse 17, if then God gave them the same gift that he gave to us when we believed, who was I that I could hinder God? Okay. Peter says they got the same gift that he gave us, which is a radical equalizing thing to say. It suggests that Gentiles are now on par with Jews in terms of their receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit in terms of their relationship with God. Now that, again, is a very radical thing to say. We take a second and go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. This is the Apostle Paul writing to a, a Gentile audience, a Greek audience, you know, So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, you Gentiles called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at one time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's where Gentiles were, strangers to the covenant of promise, alienated from God with no hope and without God in the world. And yet Peter now says they got the same Holy Spirit that we got. To a Jewish audience, he says, they got the same Holy Spirit that we got. That's a radical statement to say. That's a really radical thing because they were the people who were without hope, without God, without the covenant that God made with Abraham, without the law that God gave to Moses. They are the people on the outside But Peter says, y'all, I don't know what else to say. They got the same thing we got. That's a radical, radical thing for Peter to say. But that's what happened. All he can do is share what happened. And so that's what he does. And when he finishes, when he says that, it says, uh, verse 18. Verse 18. When they heard this, they were silenced. They were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Now, we got to slow down and read the Bible. You know, it says they were silenced and they praised God. So there's obviously some kind of a pause there. You know, it wasn't like he finished the speech and they said, hallelujah. They were silenced. There's a there's a long pause there, an awkward pause there where Peter is kind of like. Uh, I'm either about to get stoned or we're all going to TGI Fridays. I don't know, but something, you know, he's just waiting to hear what's going to happen. There's this long pause, and then they say, well, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Now, you can tell, though, there's a lingering anti-Gentile stuff there, right? It says they praise God, but why? Because God has given it 
even to the Gentiles. By saying even to the Gentiles, we can pick up on this little bit of lingering anti-Gentile sentiment. It's going to be there for the rest of the New Testament. They're going to have to wrestle with this and come back to this over and over and over again. <laughs> um, and let's see. So I, I have a question here. How did the early apostles know that this new thing was God's doing? Or put differently, why did they accept Peter's explanation? They had enough trust in Peter, right? And the six other people, right? And I think that is really important about personal testimony that we're talking about, right? People, When people appeal to their experience of God, there's really no good way to refute that in some way. It's like, I wasn't there to see the, the sheep or hear the voice. So either Peter's lying or it happened, right? And then it comes down to, what do I know of who Peter is? And then it comes down to, what do I know of these other people, right? So if I said, y'all, God gave me a vision that said, I don't know, all of us are supposed to wear um, sackcloth all the time for the next six months. You probably say, well, Jake, I think you need to pray on that one, you know? But if Bill and Irma came in and said, we have the same vision, how crazy is that? We had the exact same vision. It would cause you pause. I'm not saying that just, if they said it, then you would say, well, let's get sackcloth. But if I said it, it's like he's crazy. If Bill and Irma said it, because you know Bill and Irma, you might be like, well, What's going on here? You know? And then that's three. If Pat and Diane came and said, Y'all had the weirdest dream last night, you know? I'd be like, Oh dear. And then Larry and Gloria came in, that's six. And they said, Y'all had the weirdest dream last night. At some point, because we know the people, because we know the character of the people, and we can trust their testimony, then we have to start to take seriously that God might be leading us to do something that nobody would have expected and nobody can explain. But part of that means that we have to have a relationship with the people. To share our testimony with somebody who doesn't know us, doesn't care what we think or what we say, it can still be effective, but it's not nearly as effective as sharing our testimony with somebody who has some reason to respect what we might say. And Peter, as a leader in the church, has some relational capital that these people would hear what he would have to say, right? Um... So he gives this explanation. Now, question: I have a question about verse 18. Um, who is silenced in verse 18? Is it the whole group of Jerusalem leaders or the hardline circumcision folks? Now, I personally, this is just Jake's opinion, think it's the hardline circumcision folks. I think that they were silenced. Peter shares his thing. They, they, they were silenced. And the whole assembly celebrated with the hardline folks kind of grumpily clapping. You know, it's like people jump up and the hardline is like. <laughs> and they kind of lean. It's like, this isn't over, you know. Good job, Peter. I see what you're working on. This isn't over by any means, you know. They're still, they're not giving up on this, okay. They might, they might even be willing to say, wow, even the Gentiles, you know, who would have thought. But they're not giving up on this. And the rest of the New Testament bears that out. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next week or two is how does this play out? Because we have, I have this last quote here. It says, The Jerusalem community recognizes that the Gentiles have been given the gift of life, the gift of repentance unto life. But the issue of their relationship has not been solved. The pe um, I don't know, that's, the quote is wrong. I don't know. I must have deleted a part of the quote. Basically, the, what the quote should say is um, the issue of how they're going to be in relationship has not been solved. Will the Gentiles be brought into this thing as Gentiles or will they have to change? And how much will they have to change? And that is what the rest of the New Testament argument is going to be about that we're going to see. It's, it's kind of like at this point, nobody can deny that God has reached out to the Gentiles. Who would have thought it? But surely God doesn't intend for them to stay Gentiles, right? 
Surely God doesn't intend for them to stay Gentiles. We, that, that can't be right. So, which leads us back to our thing. What is essential for following Jesus? What is essential? And I have a question there at the bottom of the page. I think it's on y'all's too. Can you believe in two religions at the same time? So I have here, uh, this is from um, Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, Anybody familiar with Dungeons and Dragons? A game that people, okay. It's a game that was very popular in the 80s and it's coming back into popularity lately where it's basically an imagination game. You create little characters and you come up with scenarios and you roll these dice to determine like, it's like Jake and Olin getting a sword fight and then we roll dice and if he rolls a 12 and I roll a 9, it's like Olin killed Jake <laughs> and then they move on with life. Okay. But in the imaginary thing, there's all these different pantheons of gods and goddesses and religions. There's like fake religions in the game. Okay. So I've, I've got some of these here. So this is just a fake religion to use as an example. We have a uh, I don't know what that is. Eldath, the god, the goddess of peace. And that looks like grapes in a bowl, maybe. Or Gond, the god of craft. And it's like a sprocket. Is that what that's called? Uh, Helm, the god of protection. So in this imaginary religion, right, if I'm trying to build something, I might make a sacrifice to Gond, the god of craft, and say, like, Gond, please bless over my little building that I'm trying to do or whatever, you know? Or let's say I have a... Uh, uh, let's see, I don't know. Helm, God of Protection. I'm going to have to travel back and forth to Ellisville seven times this week. right? I'm going to be on these roads a lot. I'm going to pray to God, the Helm, Helm, the God of Protection, before I leave and all these things. Okay, so that's this imaginary religion. Now, can I, can I still do all that and be Christian? Mm, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't, doesn't seem like it, right? So we put over here, following Jesus, faith in Jesus, Love for our fellow man, Apostles' Creed. Uh, believe the Bible is the word of God. Now, Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is in the Bible. Yeah. So we could, we could um, flesh this out a little bit and eventually get to part of what it means to be Christian is to believe that there is one God. There are not all these gods. There's just one God. And that God is God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? So there's... A triune God that is one God. So, if we're Christian, that's part of what we, that's part of what's essential to it, right? So, if I am a Gentile who prays to all of these gods, and then I get a message from, from an angel that says, send for this guy named Simon. He's going to come and, and talk to your house and share with your whole household a message of peace. And then Peter shows up. And he starts preaching about forgiveness of sins through Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes. And now all of a sudden it's like, let's get baptized. And now I'm, I've been a Christian for two days. Okay. This stuff is still all there somewhere. This has to be dealt with. And um, Cornelius, he doesn't know any better. I mean, well, Cornelius was a God fearer, so he probably did actually know better. But the point of that is the Gentiles have things that are associated with being Gentiles that they're either going to have to leave behind as they enter into Christianity. But there are some things about being a Gentile that it's totally fine to bring with you. And the New Testament is going to spend a decent amount of time trying to work that out. What exactly is it that we can bring and not bring? And a different way of putting that question is, what is essential to Christianity? What is absolutely essential? And what can we bring with us? And what can we leave behind? And that's what we're going to see, begin to slowly but surely play out in the rest of Acts and in Paul's letters. Paul's letter to the Galatians, Paul's letter to the Romans, and uh, so on and so forth is going to be really revolving around what is essential, what, what is the absolute, this can be there, this must be there, and what are the things that are essential that can't be there, like idolatry or multiple gods. That's just a, that's a deal breaker. So it's like, you want to have long hair? You can have long hair. You want to pray to God, the God of craft? Deal breaker. Right? Now what happens is, a lot of us all have our own versions of deal breakers. Right? So I, I think it's interesting as I was thinking about this, y'all did a good job really of, of a mixture of belief 
and practice. So some of y'all may remember a few years ago, Tony Campolo, um, preacher, guy, he came up with this thing, Red Letter Christians. And he was talking about all the words that Jesus taught as kind of the, the core of his understanding of Christianity. And he said it's really amazing if you ask somebody, are they a Christian? A lot of times, most of the time, they will tell you what they believe. So if it says like, if I said, oh, like, are you a Christian? He said, I'm a Christian. I would say like, really? Do you believe in the resurrection? He'd be like, yes. Do you believe the Bible's word of God? Yes. Do you believe this? Yes. He said, we very rarely ask people, what do they do? Like, are you a Christian? And Ola says, yes. And it's like, do you visit people in prison? Do you feed the hungry? Do you clothe the naked? He's like, we, all, we, we, for some reason, we tend to focus more on what people believe than what people do as the measure of what makes a Christian. What is essential to Christianity? You have to believe these things. Or what is essential to Christianity? You have to do these things. And you all have a good balance. You have following Jesus, which is a thing to do, right? Faith in Jesus, which is a belief. You have love God and love your neighbor, which is a thing to do. Believe the Bible is a word of God. That's a belief. This, this list is, has a good balance, you know. But that's something for us to keep up with because I think the larger point of that Tony Campolo thing that I think is really interesting is the way that we tend to come up with our own little lists of what is a Christian and what isn't a Christian. And you, you either have to believe this and do this or believe this and do this. And what I would love for us to keep exploring over the, you know, the rest of our time here is what does Acts say? Which is not the end of the story because you've got the rest of the New Testament and you've got Christian history, which is going to continue to flesh that out. But at least for us, what does Acts say is essential? And that's kind of what the direction that we're going in tonight. But for tonight, at least by the end of this story, the Gentiles are in. So a couple weeks ago, we started Acts 10. Gentiles are out. Now we're in Acts, the middle of Acts 11 and Gentiles are in. And we'll spend some time trying to figure out what exactly that means. Okay, I talked a lot tonight. I'm sorry. Questions? Comments? I don't buy it. I like it. I don't like it. Anything? Okay. Well, keep that, keep that question percolating. What is essential? What are the things you have to believe? You have to do. What are the things you cannot believe? And you cannot do. We'll keep exploring that in the book of Acts. Peace and love. Have a good night. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> okay. But see, that's a very that's a very Gentile and Pauline thing to say. I'm with you a thousand percent, you know. But that's very that's because we're that was not obvious to me, you know. I think I, I think I heard Pat saying it's the intent, it's the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, kind of right. But that's definitely not what they had prior to that, you know. I mean. Absolutely. Absolutely. And not just what you did, what you what you raised your children in. It's like I, I dedicated my life to this. I told my children this was of the most importance. And now you're telling me it's not that important. That's that's a hard thing to swallow, you know. All right. Would you like to preach sometime? No. We can. <laughs> that'll that'll work. Though. Hey, by the way, I know that y'all already had to do this some in the early parts of the pandemic. But anybody that wants to share a word, Sarah, Joe, and I will put you up there in a heartbeat. And we, because we really believe it means a lot to people to hear from people in their own church what God is doing in their life. So, let us know. Okay. Peace and love.